So first, I just want to say that I do work for MSF, but I'm not representing MSF today. These are my opinions. What is a doctor? What is a nurse? What is a paramedic? Are we defined by being a good clinician? By being a good scientist? We all strive for excellence in those arenas. That's why we come to conferences like this. That's what a lot of these talks are about. How to recognize disease, how to prognosticate. How can we do procedures better? What medicines can we give to save lives, to, to mitigate morbidity? But it isn't always just about that, as we've been hearing this morning. Sometimes you can be all those things and you still can't protect your patient. And sometimes you can't be those things. And so there has to be something more. Last year, I went with MSF to a project on the Jordan-Syrian border. And I'm going to play you a video, and it is a bit long, but bear with me because I want you to have the overview. We've reported extensively from this region about Syrian refugees who are living in camps, Syrian refugees who are urban refugees living in cities and in towns. But these tens of thousands of Syrian refugees are living in the middle of nowhere in a place that, according to uh, aid agencies, is not a refugee camp. They fled their homes in search of safety, but this is where their journey ended, a makeshift graveyard in no man's land between Jordan and Syria. Dozens are said to be buried here. This desolate desert known as the Berm is where more than 75,000 Syrian refugees have been stranded for months, surviving almost on nothing. They can't go back. They can't come forward into Jordan, and they are not really even permitted to exist where they are. So they're sort of being insidiously phased out of existence, um, almost like ghosts. They're not seen. Um, and they're not recognized by, by any entity. As Jordan tightened its border with Syria late last year, allowing only small numbers of refugees across, the population at the berm grew. In June, access for aid agencies became impossible after a suicide attack by ISIS on Jordanian border guard killed at least six troops. The kingdom sealed off the berm, declaring it a closed military zone. There's been one food drop since the bombing and that was for 30 days, and that ran out um, on the 2nd of September. So there's no meaningful sanitation there, there's no protection, there's no access to health care. The World Food Programme had to use a crane to make that single food drop into the berm in early August. Our requests to visit the area were denied by the Jordanian military, citing security concerns. But through Syrian activists and cell phone footage filmed for CNN, we got a glimpse into the dire living conditions. In the scorching desert heat and in makeshift tents, they've been receiving limited amounts of water. There have been reports of newborn deaths, deaths from a hepatitis outbreak, and cases of severe dehydration. This mother says she's been in the berm for about a year. Her baby girl has no milk, no food, just a little bit of boiled rice. Abu Muhammad from Homs says his four-month-old son is buried here. He needed medicine and oxygen, but there's no hospitals, he says. This old woman says, I have no one. I'm hungry and thirsty. Help me. With no access, aid agencies say it's hard to assess the true scale of human suffering at the berm. Jordan, which is hosting more than a million Syrians, says the nation's security is its top priority. It says the area is becoming an ISIS enclave. In a statement to CNN, the government says, we are in continuous discussion with aid agencies regarding this issue, and we continue to emphasize Jordan's legitimate security concerns and the best way aid can be delivered. This is an international problem, not Jordan's problem. So after the bomb, the Jordanians closed the border completely. No agencies were permitted to go near the berm, and apart from a little bit of water, Nothing got in, and nothing got out. And my patients, all 75,000 of them, were trapped behind the berm, 
invisible, unreachable. What is a doctor now? Can you be a scientist? I tried. I built a network and tried to collect as much data as I could from inside the berm. But collecting unwitnessed information is complicated. There are agendas that cannot be known. Information can be biased. It's really difficult to verify stories, videos, pictures. Um, information cannot be reported accurately, reported scientifically, unless you're seeing it. Stewardship of information collected by this way of communicating was also difficult. Those outside the berm would ask me, is the child in this video from a month ago likely to be alive or dead now? Is this a photo of a gunshot wound? Is this case really an emergency? What about this woman? Is she dead in the video or could she be alive? And then from those inside the berm, what is wrong with this woman? She's shaking and we think that she's pregnant. This boy died today and his brother yesterday. We don't know why. This man is bleeding to death. Why don't you do something? Why don't you send medicines? You're, there's blood on your hands. I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated too. I tried to ask them, how many people have this disease? How many women have died in childbirth? They just didn't know. So I couldn't be a clinician, and I couldn't be a scientist. So what is a doctor now? And I say doctor because that's what I am, but what are any of us now? What is left? We'll come back to the berm, but I want to take you somewhere a bit more familiar. There's a cat two febrile neonate in cubicle five that hasn't been seen yet on 15 minutes. The mum in nine wants to take her kid home against medical advice. They haven't even seen a doctor yet and they've been waiting for ages. Um, the pediatric reg came down and had a go at the intern and now she's crying in the toilets. It was a really bad referral. Um, <laughs> Yeah. In the adult ED, the cardiologists want to take the palliative care patient in three to the cath lab. There's a sepsis on tropes in resource that hasn't got an ICU bed, and the bat phone just rang. <sighs> what is a doctor now? It's easy, right? It's not the berm. Um, we treat patients. That's what we do. Or is it easy? How can you promptly identify neonatal sepsis if your department is so overstretched that you don't see your cat twos within 10 minutes? Do you let that mum take her kid home without chatting to her first? Do you walk past while the cardiologists see the right coronary artery? Or do you help them see the patient? We advocate. We try to help the patient find their voice. And if they cannot have a voice, then we speak out for what we hope is in their best interests. Patients in the berm didn't have a voice, but patients in your hospital also may need help to find their voice. Young children, elderly patients with dementia, patients with uh, mental capacity problems, the generic patient impacted by systems problems and underfunding, all of these people may need your help to find their voice. So advocacy was what I did a lot of for six months in the berm, but it's what I do a lot of in the ED. The clinical stuff, the, the human factor stuff, the teaching stuff is amazing and it's super important, but it's not the whole story. If we don't advocate for our patients against all the things that come into play when they're trying to access healthcare, it maybe doesn't matter how good you are at putting in a central line, whether you're buying into the sepsis 3.0 definitions or not. It maybe doesn't even matter how good you are at leading a resus team. Your patient might not get the care they need, or they might get care that's not in their best interests. So we advocate with the bed manager to get that sepsis patient to a critical be care bed, with the cardiologists to facilitate their patient's autonomy, and with that mum, that strung out mum with three kids at home that just wants to get out of there to make sure that her child gets seen 
the Kawasaki's gets diagnosed and her child doesn't die. So how do we do it? How do we advocate? We tell their stories. This is an essential tenet in, ad in advocacy. In the berm, it was quite difficult. Some stories couldn't be told. Some stories had to be told as apocryphal. Some couldn't be verified. Um, some had to be leaked. <laughs> it's not easy. Confidentiality must be protected, but tell their stories. Wordsmithing. Cultivate your message. Treat it like a bonsai tree. Take little bits off and put it together to give maximum impact and limit the possibility of putting things at risk for you, for your organization, for your patients. Volume. Is it an email? Is it a conversation? Is it a meeting? Is it going loud and proud in the media? Is it somewhere in between? Graded advocacy. We live in difficult times. Advocacy is a form of communication that recognizes politics and the influence that it has over our patients. Medicine is inherently political. The quality of healthcare, the distribution of healthcare, the funding of healthcare, the social determinants of health, a patient's own political leanings, all of these things can influence the care that a patient receives. Politics is in the berm, but it's also in your ED, in your PICU in your OT and your GP practice. We need to accept how it influences what happens to our patients, and by extension, how we maneuver with advocacy to protect them. Network and relationship building. So it's much easier to get the pediatric reg to calm down and not harass your intern if you have a prior relationship with her. And before I um, cause a Twitter storm, I'm not picking on pediatric registrars. <laughs> it's just an example. Um, so if you made her a cup of tea the last time she came down to the ED and had five referrals, if you put that difficult drip in when you weren't as busy as she was, this is called being a good human. <laughs> but it also starts a relationship. In the berm, this translated to spending time with other agencies, with the UN, the government, the military, showing a little kindness to individuals in an austere environment like the berm, like the hospital, allows you to understand more about their agenda, about their influences. Somehow you have a personal connection with these people, even though you might otherwise be very far apart. Understanding influence. So power is not distributed the way that it says it is on paper. Think about scrubs. One of the most powerful people in scrubs is the janitor. Once we map and understand these power structures, then it allows you to target the entities and individuals that really have control of the situation with your advocacy. So these are some of the tenets of advocacy. But how far would you go? After months of internal discussions about your under-resourcing in your ED, would you or would you support your director to go public, to whistleblow about systems problems that are impacting patient care? What about if there was systematic racism, sexism, or bullying in your institution? Would you go public? It's not an easy decision. There are inherent risks and costs to advocacy at the pointy end. People don't like loud whistles. They might ask you to be quiet. They might question your credibility. You might struggle to continue to work, to not be gagged, to be a David in a world of Goliaths. Some people didn't want the BEM situation highlighted. They wanted it to go away. And so we had to recalculate and reevaluate very frequently the risks, the organizational risks, the personal risks, the risk to the team. 
And most importantly, the risk to the people that we're advocating for. What might happen to them if we said the wrong thing? So, how far would you go? How much would you risk? And do you see advocacy as something that partly defines you? Maybe not. Maybe because you don't like risk, but then you wouldn't be in medicine. Maybe because advocacy is ill-defined, it's a bit woolly, it's political. Um, maybe because it looks difficult, but we do other difficult things every day. But maybe you're on the fence, it's okay. Even if you're all in, you need to get ready to lose. I want to ask you to think about a patient for a minute. Think about a patient that felt like a loss. Hold that feeling in your hand and multiply it. In advocacy, the losses can be so tremendous. They can come at the end of months of work, of sacrifices, of risk. And they can be unclear. Have you lost the game or the match? Have you lost or have you given up, not done enough? And they can be very far-reaching. It can be 75,000 people. After eight months of advocacy, MSF elected to disengage from the berm situation. We were a lone voice that was not being heard. We were at risk of being instrumentalized and becoming part of the problem. We didn't know if we were putting these people at risk by how we were advocating. And the security situation just became extremely precarious and the political context was not moving. So we took a step back. And now we're observing, waiting for an opportunity to re-engage, following. It was really hard for us um, as an organization, and it was hard for me personally, because I'm a pusher. Um, <laughs> I won't deny it. When you have 75,000 patients behind a fence, you push a lot. Um, but sometimes you can push so hard, you can push it over. Sometimes you have to lose the battle to win the war. It's the same with patients. And I hope that's where we are right now with the bear. I really hope that we will get the opportunity to re-engage and to move forward as the political situation evolves. I can't tell you when to push and when to wait. Every situation is different and I'm still learning. But it's okay. <laughs> Advocacy is not defined by loss. Some of the greatest wins I have ever seen in MSF have been through advocacy, and I have been lucky enough to be part of some of them. Every single day in the ED, I see a win through advocacy. The palliative care patient was my patient. The Kawasaki mom was my patient. In these polemic and challenging times, I wanted to underline to you all today that you are all already advocates. How far you decide to go with advocacy is up to you, but I want you to know yourself as an advocate, and I want to encourage you to stand up and be counted. Silence has long been confused with neutrality. We may not be sure that words can always save lives, but we know that silence can certainly kill. What is a doctor? What is a nurse? What is a paramedic? Many things, but surely an advocate. It's part of what defines us.
you very much, Nat. It's very moving. <laughs> I think it's important to see that we can all be advocates no matter where we are. Marianne, have you got anything from questions from Twitter? Uh, so, Nat, advocacy and telling stories has resonated with the audience. Um, some beautiful quotes and reinterpretation. A musical medic, think about a patient that felt like a loss, hold that and then multiply it. This is the risk with advocacy. Losses can be tremendous. Um, and Aidan from uh, Our Little Medic has a question. <laughs> How do you cope being back in the country and feeling like they are still there and need you? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's not easy um, to leave a situation behind. It was very difficult for us as an organisation. Um, I do think, on reflection, it was the right call. Um, yeah, I think of them a lot. I think that's, that's normal, especially having had those kind of communications. It's quite intimate, so... Um, but this is the world that we live in. All that we can do is, is try um, and work in these very complicated situations. And, and as I said in my talk, the whole point is that this is not about that situation. It's about healthcare and it's about helping patients um, get what they need. And that's happening in Prince of Wales in Sydney where I'm currently working and it's happening in the BAM. But the two things are not so, so different. I'm also putting out there, of course, there's microphones. Is there any questions from the floor at all? Um, anything else? Um, just sharing yep. Diana E. Ward Warburton's. Um, Nat, every day, every single day, I see a win for ag advocacy in the ED. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you think, Nat, can I ask a question? How do you think we prepare ourselves to be advocates? I think the first step, um, which is probably a step that a lot of people have already taken, is recognising that you are an advocate, that that's part of your role as a healthcare provider. Um, and then looking for opportunities to, to do that in your, in your daily work and thinking about, is this patient able to communicate what they want? Because it's not about being paternalistic, it's about facilitating the patient to make the decisions they want to make. And then if they can't have a voice, then, then you can speak for them and try and think, what would I want if I was this patient? Um, so I think a lot of it is, is, is thinking about it. Um, putting it into your uh, lexicon or into your armamentarian as a doctor. And it sounds like you were very conscious that you could actually contribute a lot more to far more people as an advocate. How do you balance that with the single immediate suffering in front of you in some of the places that you'd been? Um, I think it, it depends on the role. I mean, you can't do everything all the time. Um, my most recent role, for example, in Mosul, I was running the ED and I wasn't doing a lot of advocacy. Somebody else was doing that. Right. So um, just separate it. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but still, on the individual level, I think you do those individual ED advocacy things all the time. So, but yeah, the broader, the big macro stuff, you, you need, that needs, that's a full-time job. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that's a challenge for many of us is that getting better at advocating for right. single patients and recognising you sometimes need to step back yeah. and look at the bigger picture uh, as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.